Manga Common here, and I think I should clarify something when it comes to Persona 4 and its updated version in Gold. I love the games. They came out during a time where I was going through a rough patch in my life where I couldn't really stand myself as a person and playing through the game, I couldn't help but feel endeared by the characters and the trials they had to go through, whether it be the overall mystery or the mundanity of everyday life issues. What I'm trying to say is that Persona 4 holds a special place in my cold heart. And even though it's clearly not a perfect game, I've demonstrated that in multiple videos of mine, I'd be lying if it wasn't an important game to me. And it seems like almost every year, someone new picks up the game and blatantly misrepresents the title. And it always comes to this egotistical, I'm better than you, my interpretation is a fact attitude. Now, there's nothing wrong with wanting to stand behind with what you believe in. I find that to be a very admirable trait once in a while. But when it's used to put down other people and attack people otherwise, now, now it's my it's problem. Because a little 411 who don't know, interpretation is not fact. It's subjective. And taking scenes out of context, the back of your interpretation is lying, and therefore said interpretation can be made in bad faith. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Hi, I'm Manga Common, professional complainer on the net. Nice to meet you. Hope you're having a good day. Get your pitchforks ready, because I'm about to ruin your day. This video is going to be going all out, baby. We're finally talking about Persona 4 in an actual analytical sense. Much more than a single tweet can ever do. You're pointing that gun the wrong way. It should go without saying, but this video will contain spoilers of Persona 4, and you should at least have an understanding of the plot of the game. Oh, and, uh, spoilers from Metal Gear Solid 2 as well. Yeah, I know, I'm weird. I should also point out this video will also feature opinions, opinions you might disagree with. Unless we're talking about what actually happens in the game and what being is explained, there will be interpretations. So get your glasses, let's jump right in. Welcome to the Velvet Room. In order for us to actually discuss Persona 4, we need to actually establish a major part of the game, the Midnight Channel. In Inaba, there's a rumor that goes around if you watch your TV at midnight when it's on a rainy day, you see your soulmate. In actuality, the Midnight Channel is a reflection of the group human consciousness, so when someone who shows up on the television in Inaba, they fall into the public eye. There's a lot more we can go into right now, but it's at this point that we need to discuss what a shadow is and how they reflect the Midnight Channel. This is where the issues and misunderstanding of Persona's 4 story, in my opinion, come into play. Let us take a moment and consider a line. I am a shadow, the true self. I am a shadow, the true self. I am a shadow. I am a shadow. I am a shadow. I am a shadow. The true self. I get it! This isn't actually true. Shadows in the world of Persona are only a part of what a person is. They tend to be the repressed negative thoughts and impulses of their real life counterparts, only uninhibited and amplified to threatening proportion. Even more so when you consider the fact that the shadows of people who aren't shown on TV aren't actually presented in exaggerated ways. To point this out, let's look at Yosuke, Chie, and Teddy's shadows. If you take the time to notice, they are only dressed in their usual attire, and the only difference being that their eyes are yellow. Well, Teddy's got a big size, but eh. Meanwhile, characters like Yukiko, Kanji, Risei, and Naoto, well, their shadows should be easy to see that they're more exaggerated because of how they act and how they dress. The reason for this is because the Midnight Channel and Shadows are a reflection of the public perception of a person. Because of this, the Shadows adopt eccentric personality traits, mannerisms, and attire as a dramatic display to conform to the rumors of the person that have been some truth to them. This is why, for example, Kanji's shadow was that of an offensively stereotypical gay man is the way he is. This stems from Kanji's insecurity concerning his sexuality and feminine personality traits. By the way, I should point out this is not my interpretation that the Midnight Channel and the Shadows reflect the group of consciousness of humanity. This is established in the game during the section where you can get the bad ending if you choose to fail the correct path when dealing with Namatame, the guy who's been throwing most of the people in the course of the game into TVs in an attempt to save them. I failed, but it wasn't my fault, and the law can't touch me anyway. What? Is that what Namatame's really thinking? Then wasn't deranged or anything. He knew what he was doing. To hell with the law. I will never forgive what you did. This is where a lot of people who analyze, quote unquote, Persona 4 seem to stop at, where they consider that these are the actual thoughts of those whose shadows are on the television. It's why if people believe that Kanji is gay or Naoto is trans. But 
We just heard the guy's true feelings on TV! While these shadows are a part of a person's consciousness, they aren't the true feelings. The midnight channel we saw in Namatame's hospital room, that kept bothering me since. What we saw there wasn't Namatame's true intentions at all. Then it came on because we were all thinking, this person must be the killer, he can't be forgiven? The thing about the Persona series is that it takes a lot of inspiration from psychology, because, well, duh, it's a series dealing with psychological mind fucks and personal issues. So, come on, Common, don't be so general. Specifically, Persona takes a lot of inspiration from Carl Jung's psychology theories, specifically the archetype. Now, I'm not a psychologist. Shocker. I'm barely even a person at this point. So forgive me if I'm not the best person to translate psychological terms into general speech. Shadows are part of our personality that we repress or reject, whether it be because it's an aspect that we don't like about ourselves, or it could be what we perceive that society doesn't like about us. Notice that point. What society won't like. This is one of the points that we have to consider when it comes to the Midnight Channel and Shadows, especially considering the characters who have much more exaggerated shadow selves who are the only ones who are shown on television and were in the public mind. Failing to understand and failing to listen are rather different things. Later on in the game, we are distinctly told by Amiel Sagiri, the creator of the Midnight Channel, this. You mean the power to enter the TV? Then the Midnight Channel, was that phenomenon also your doing? Humans fail to see things as they truly are. They choose to see only what they wish. I acted only in support of this. A world filled with desires, viewed through a window from which one sees what one wishes to see. Humans departed from reality of their own volition, craving more false images. A window that shows people what they want to see. So that's why those who got famous suddenly appeared on the Midnight Channel, one after another. It was all in people's minds. I have to say, it must be true. The Midnight Channel we saw in Namatame's hospital room, that kept bothering me since. What we saw there wasn't Namatame's true intentions at all. Then it came on because we were all thinking, this person must be the killer, he can't be forgiven? We let ourselves be deluded. Now you may be thinking, but doesn't this contradict the shadows being a part of the actual person though, accepting a part of yourself? If these shadows are essentially created by the public, then why would our characters have to accept them at all? That, my friends, is another stumbling point. You see, this is where we turn to psychology ourselves again. That there is a you, a being made up of your own experiences, and a you that is perceived by people. You may have your own idea on who you are, but you can't escape how you are seen by others. It also makes up who you are whether you like it or not. And honestly, they don't have to be truthful. If you want a key example of what I'm talking about, uh, just look at me. In case you don't realize it, I don't show my face on my channel. I essentially wear a mask. Therefore, this is a persona. How I view myself is separate from how others will perceive me. I may see myself as a good person. My family may think I'm lazy and like to foot them with the bills at restaurants. And writers seem to think I'm a sexist, homophobic person because I dare to express an opinion in video format that they do not care for. There are countless interpretations of me out there on the internet, and unfortunately that is a part of the identity that people have, even if it's an incorrect assessment of myself. People will view you however they want to view you. That is human nature. So we come back to a question. What is a shadow? What is the true self? Consider what the characters do in Persona 4 whenever they face their shadows. They reject them. They deny whatever flaws they have, whatever problems they may have in their lives, but they also run away from the world that wishes to slap a label onto them. In other words, shadows are an amalgamation of not only the insecurities that the characters have, but also the public views them. And because of that, these perceptions of ourselves can contradict each other. They clash. And it's natural because we as humans often try to figure ourselves out by testing our boundaries. More often than not, shadows are a part of our unconsciousness that we do not have control over. That harbors our innermost feelings. That can also include insecurities. In contrast, a persona is a mask that we use to interact with other people and we use them consciously. Shadows themselves, as we establish, are also from a collective unconsciousness, a sea of thoughts that link every human being together. The collective unconsciousness is also a term coined by Jung. The Midnight Channel is closely connected to the sea of unconsciousness, so their thoughts of the characters made them appear on the Midnight Channel. Each shadow that you encounter in the game is influenced by this collective unconsciousness to some degree, and it also affects what your inner self feelings are. So while the shadows are a part of the person, they also represent the public viewing of what the characters were like. Does that mean to say characters like Kanji don't have homosexual feelings? No, not in my opinion, since he still has his insecurity with women. 
And I won't lie that there are moments that point to that, but with lines like this... Yeah, I know. I've known all this time I had something like you. It ain't a matter of guys or chicks. I'm just scared shitless of being rejected. I'm a total pansy who tries to make everyone hate me. I feel as though there's a lot more deeper emotions, insecurities, and character beats that a lot of people tend to gloss over and just focus on the gay aspect. Shadows, as a lot of people tend to do, ignore that they are the extremes. If that wasn't the case, then Yukiko would be deep down a spoiled princess wanting someone to save her, or Rise would be a stripper deep down. But it's at this point that we need to change gears and really talk about the more contentious characters and their shadows. And I want to start with my favorite character in the game, Kanji. So arrogant and self-centered, they cry if you get angry, they gossip behind your back, they spread nasty lies, they look at me like some, some disgusting thing, and say that I'm a weirdo, laughing at me all the while. You like to sew? What a queer. Painting is so not you. But you're a guy. You don't act like a guy. Why aren't you manly? What does it mean to be a guy? What does it mean to be manly? Girls are so scary. Kanji Tatsumi is my favorite character in Persona, not just Persona 4, but the whole series. Mainly because I myself have gone through a lot of issues that he's gone through as well. And to be clear, no, I'm not referring to the sexuality aspect, although for me that's more of a recent realization. <clears throat> Rather, it has to do with the liking of things and being judged for it. As the clip a few minutes ago explained, his insecurity stemmed from him liking girly things and being told he wasn't being manly. Now, these may seem innocuous comments, but these happened when Kanji was younger, and as we learned in his social link, Kanji didn't really have friends because of him wanting to play house or go to home ec instead of gym. Mockery plus loneliness can have devastating effects on a person, and it's eventually what led to Kanji's delinquent behaviors. It's what led to Kanji simply wanting to be accepted by someone. Anyone. Again, a lot of this is not my opinion, this is information that the game gives you. But you need to seek it out in order to actually learn more about this stuff. You need to find Kanji's truth. And as you go through his social link, you learn more and see that he's able to accept his talents are liked by people, how it's a foreign concept to him. Due to an incident where a girl he liked back in school got mocked because he fixed her bag, as well as how he was treated growing up. Yeah, that's the kind of house I grew up in. So I've been interested in sewing and stuff since I was a kid. The second I say stuff like that, people look at me funny. Girls make fun of me, the people in the neighborhood treat me like I'm some zoo animal. So I was sick of everything. And when I got to my senses, I was running wild. It's through a social link that Kanji learns to accept this part of him, that you can still be a strong man regardless of your likes. And it actually stems from his father. Dad told me something right before he died. If you're a man, you have to become strong. I felt like he was telling me I wasn't a real man, it pissed me off. So I changed my looks and pushed myself away from people. Fighting gangs, thinking I was protecting mom, trying to catch this killer. I thought all that was how I was becoming strong. That I was really making up for all the trouble I caused. I was drunk off my power. But that wasn't it. That ain't what dad meant. I still don't really get what being strong means, but I'm gonna start by not lying to myself. No more being scared of everyone, hiding my hobbies, staying away from people. Anytime, any place, I'm gonna bust right through as my own self. That's the way to deal with that other me in the TV world. As long as there's someone like that snot-nosed kid to accept me, I ain't afraid of nothing. It goes back to what Kanji's shadow says too. What does it mean to be a guy? What does it mean to be manly? What does it mean to be a real man? Well, Kanji does find his own answer. Of course no one could understand me. I've been keeping my distance out of fear. So I decided that I'd do things my way, no matter how tough. But it ain't just about hanging out with guys who understand you and telling the rest to get bent. You gotta make an effort if you want people to understand you. I wasn't even trying. Not just about my hobby, but like when the police suspected me. It didn't even cross my mind to try to tell them my story. I let them think whatever they want. And because of that, you, Ma, and that kid all got dragged into it. I didn't put in the slightest effort to try and make them understand. 
it's easier for me to act tough. So from now on, I got two rules. Rule one, be myself. Rule two, get people to understand me. To me, this is what Kanji's story is about. It's about acceptance, not just for what you like, but for you as a person. In a sense, I can understand why a lot of people can relate to Kanji's story. Who doesn't yearn to be accepted by the world, especially when it's for a reason that isn't deemed to be normal? Girls are so loud and obnoxious, so, you know, I, I really don't like dealing with them. Guys are a lot more laid back. So, uh, I started thinking, what if I'm the type who never gets interested in girls? And I couldn't accept that, so I kept spinning around and around in my head. A lot of this information, at least to me, tends to be often overlooked when it comes to Kanji's character, and people will often focus on the gay aspect of his shadow when they talk about him. What doesn't help is that Troy Baker, Kanji's original voice actor, said this years ago. Yeah, Kanji was clearly gay. Clearly gay. I mean, they set it up very well because, you know, here's this tough dude that's, you know, really like, you know, uh, but then when you see in the shadow world, when you actually see his real self. There's that. So, you know, and, and they, the, all the guys from Atlas were like, he's gay, Let's just take it that way. Now, I don't really have a reason to doubt Troy here, other than his stupid haircut, but from what I've shown you throughout this section, I have a hard time believing that this to be the case, that Kanji is straight up gay. Besides, unless Atlas themselves came out and said this, I don't normally take the voice actor's testimony at face value because they don't contribute to the actual writing of the story and characters. To make something clear though, I don't really care about Kanji's sexuality. To me, that's not the point of his character. It's about acceptance and how others perceive you, and how if you don't do anything to challenge those negative perceptions, people will just get the wrong idea about you and spread it. As I've demonstrated, as you go through his story, Kanji is much less reluctant to reveal his likes, knitting, and other crafts towards the end of Persona 4 than his initial reveal, but that's something that you, the player, has to seek out in order to find this. <laughs> I've never talked about any of this stuff before. Guess I never had anyone to tell it to. I guess I wasn't really afraid of girls. I was just scared of people in general. But all that's behind me. Tanji isn't really a complicated character, but he isn't a bad character and his story can easily be applied to a lot of different people. Who doesn't have fears about being accepted by others? Putting up walls to prevent others from hurting us. Something like this can easily be applied to a gay person's experience. I'm not going to deny that, and I'd have to be blind to ignore some blatant imagery. But by that same token, we need to be able to read and take into consideration the other factors and lines that Kanji has in his own personal story in order to understand his character in full. You can't just take one aspect or situation of a character and splay that all over him, especially when it's a character that you can interact with. Of course, there's another character that we need to talk about. My status as a child was sufficient to offend many of those whom I worked with. Were that the only issue, then it would have resolved itself with time. But though I will one day change from a child to an adult, I will never change from a woman to a man. Do you not like being a girl? Is that why you always dress like a boy? My sex doesn't fit my ideal image of a detective. Besides, the police department is a male-oriented society. If they had the slightest concrete reason to look down on me, no one would need me anymore. Naoto Shirogani, the Detective Prince of Persona 4. Naoto has always been a bit of an interesting character to talk about, and how her story has been a subject of controversy, even if I believe a lot of this controversy comes from people who didn't pay attention to what was actually being said. When we talk about Naoto's story about wanting to become a man, a lot of people will often ignore that Naoto's desire to become a man stems from not getting external validation from male peers in the police department. She doesn't have an internal dissatisfaction with her body inherently, which is a fundamental part of being trans, at least that's what a good number of my trans peers have told me. Me. Naoto's story is a story about sexism and discrimination, as Naoto's story clearly states that. She explicitly states that she just wants to be a guy only because as a woman, being a detective is harder than if she were a man. Besides, the police department is a male-oriented society. If they had the slightest concrete reason to look down on me, no one would need me anymore. You see, in the real world, a lot of women do face a lot of hardship trying to get their work as respectable as men's. Authors in the past have used male-sounding names just to get their books read in some cases. 
for an example. So something like this isn't outside the realm of possibility for people to think that a male-dominated profession there would be sexist glass ceilings. As a side note, I'm not a feminist, but I can tell you that sexism is real. Back to Naoto, her story and insecurity come from her fears of not being accepted, a similar beat to that of Kanji's own story. In fact, there are a lot of similarities between Naoto's and Kanji's backstories. Take for example that Naoto enjoys things like robots and cars as opposed to softer toys, kind of like how Kanji was more interested in home ec and sewing. Naoto blatantly says that she didn't have any friends growing up, similar to Kanji. Like, my interpretation of all this leads to the implication that as a child, Naoto was comfortable with the sex she was born with because she did not see anything wrong in being a female with masculine interests until she had more encounters with society at large. Another thing that should be noted for this analysis is that when you, uh, the player character you and Naoto have a knife drawn on them. And if you choose to protect Naoto, she gets mad at you and says that a specific line. I can't imagine becoming a woman only to have a man protect me. This is actually similar to a scene with another girl in the game, Chie. Similar situations where you put yourself in danger or interrupt the situation, and it should be noted that they have similar reactions. The only difference is that Chie doesn't have issues with her sexuality. I bring this up as it really comes off that their issues stem from not being taken seriously by you because they're girls, and not because they want to be a man. Naoto's social link culminates in a very important scene. If I solve this town's murder case, then everyone would accept me. They would acknowledge me as the fifth in the Shiragane lineage of detectives. That's what I told myself. I just wanted to be accepted. I wanted to be needed. That's why I fretted and stood on my tiptoes and focused only on solving the case. But the original reason I wanted to become a detective, it was because mysteries intrigued me and I could help people by solving them. That's all. I remember now. Do you recall the time I faced myself in the TV world? It was my task to accept the self who yelled, I want a reason for me to stay. But my reason to stay was not solely to solve the crime. You, everyone, gave me a reason. You gave me a place to stay. I have to be an adult. I have to be a man. With that way of thinking, I was running for myself. I don't need to look for something to change or something to accomplish. I only need to have faith in myself. I finally think I can accept myself. That I'm a woman. That I haven't yet become the detective I wanted to be. I... I am a woman. And a detective. To me, this is the final proof to see. Naoto specifically states that her shadow longed for belonging and acceptance that she thought she could achieve by becoming a real detective and acting like a man. But in reality, neither of those things would gain her the acceptance that she sought. It's at this point I do have to ask a few questions. Do you think that Naoto's arc would be sending a positive message if she was trans? Because as presented, the idea is that if you face misogynistic pressures from people in your field, even if you have no internal dissatisfaction with your body's current gender, you need to transition in order to be successful. Successful. From what I've shown you all directly lifted from the game, should Naoto's story be a one-for-one one of trans people? Now, this isn't me saying you can't view Naoto's story through a trans lens, or even want Naoto to be trans, or even take something akin to a trans mindset from her story, because a lot of Naoto's experiences do overlap with the trans experience, and I'm certainly not going to be the kind of asshole who generalizes and says my interpretation is superior to all those people. <laughs> but from what I've seen from people explaining Naoto's story and why they believe she's trans, they leave out the factor of that Naoto's pressures are extremely external and not internal. And while I'm not going to say my interpretation is the one true one, I find it to be really immature to stamp your feet because Naoto isn't trans, and then project that onto Atlas and the creators of Persona in that regard. Naoto feels like, despite her exceptional skills, her age and gender pose an obstacle in getting legitimate recognition from her peers and law enforcement. She wanted to grow up and become an adult slash man for that particular goal, not just because she felt like she really identified as a man. In my interpretation, I find Naoto's story to be very progressive for three reasons. One, it covers workplace generated inequality. 
Two, it covers unequal representation in media. And three, it shows double standards and unfair societal expectations that females are held up to in our world. But as I said before, a lot of trans people saw parallels to Naoto and what trans people go through. And if you do, that is fine. My issues comes from slamming the game because their story didn't end the way you wanted and using your interpretation as fact to get onto people's cases. I'd also like to point out that a lot of people's interpretations often leave out a lot of context and ignore what the game is clearly trying to say, and that to me is enough reason to discount opinions when you take singular statements out of context. I am all for representation in characters who are plus. Hell, I technically count as a part of that community nowadays. But to me, this isn't the way to get proper representation, especially from a game that was from 2008. I'm not sure on how contentious this is, but if you disagree with me, that's perfectly fine what I'm about to say. But I believe that judging a piece of media from years ago, especially by today's standards, is a tricky business and a little unfair. Now, that isn't me saying you can't criticize an older piece. That'd be dumb for someone like me to say, since a lot of my more recent materials have been focused on older media. But when you're criticizing older media, you have to remember that the media is often written in a vacuum and based upon the culture and time period it's in. Well, save for futuristic stuff, but that's based upon stuff that hasn't actually happened yet in our world, but whatever. Persona 4 was released in 2008, and during that time period, trans issues really weren't at the forefront of public concern. And to me, Naoto's storyline is more of an issue of feminist, sexist, gender norms in certain environments. Our world doesn't stop on a dime, terminology and worldviews have changed, so the meaning of Naoto says in regards to wishing that she was born male can be viewed less as, I wish to be born a male so I can do this thing I love and be treated seriously, to, I wish I was born a male because that's my true gender, which isn't true to Nato's character or story, depending on what we're given here. It has to be considered that a lot of Persona 4 is being viewed from a Westerner perspective. Now, normally that's not an issue, and I'm certainly not trying to say that Japan doesn't have trans characters in their media and IRL. I think you'd have to be dumb at that point if you claim that. But we as Westerners do tend to view media in our own cultural lens, which I guess through a modern day lens as well. That isn't to say it's a bad thing per se. Since everyone's got a different lens when it comes to media interpretation, it's fine to point out the issues you have with games, even if they're personal. Take, for example, the trans character in Persona 3's Babe Hunt on the beach, where trans people weren't put in the greatest of light. That's an issue can be criticized, as it's a pretty terrible stereotype and depiction of a trans person in media. To me, that can be fairly criticized and can be brought up against Persona as a series. No problem, I got nothing against that. But my problem with a lot of analysis by people is that they clearly leave out a lot of the aspects that clearly show that some of their conclusions are incorrect and leave no wiggle room for interpretations or that they could be wrong. Now, before you type in the comics that I do that myself, well, no, I don't think my analysis is the be-all and end-all for all Persona 4 discussion. I've come to realize that I'm a flawed human being, and as I've said in multiple videos, my word is not law. Not from lack of trying, mind you, I just don't have that power. And it doesn't stop people from thinking that I do have it. That being said, Persona 4 and Golden are not above criticism or literary analysis. But you'll have to forgive me when I say it, analysis, and I use that in big quotes, is made at the expense of showcasing materials that actively contradict your analysis. You can't just take a single screenshot and scream TRANSPHOBIA, especially when there's surrounding context that is clearly being ignored and proves you wrong. In all honesty, that's really what pushed me to make this video, because, ironically enough, when people do this, it actively shows me that they didn't either play the game in full, didn't pay attention or outright missed the point a Persona 4 was making. Humans fail to see things as they truly are. They choose to see only what they wish. I acted only in support of this. A world filled with desires, viewed through a window from which one sees what one wishes to see. Humans departed from reality of their own volition, craving more false images. This is the part where I bring up Metal Gear Solid 2 in a Persona 4 video, because frankly, what we're seeing right now reminds me of what happens in Metal Gear Solid 2. Current digitized world. Trivial information is accumulating every second, preserved in all its triteness. Never fading, always accessible. Rumors about petty issues, misinterpretations, slander. All this junk data, preserved in an unfiltered state, growing at an alarming rate. One withdraws into their own small gated community, afraid of a large.
It is an inevitability that something like this is to occur. And frankly, as you're watching this video, I doubt I'll change anyone's mind, because, like I said on Twitter, that website has become essentially the Midnight Channel in and of itself. Because once a thought or perception is made and gets enough support, then it's seen as the truth by the masses who blindly agree with something that they clearly ignored evidence about. It's like a virus, and one I don't think can actually cure it at this point unless Twitter is ripped from the roots. Failing to understand and failing to listen are rather different things, and it's unfortunate that every time Persona 4 comes into the limelight, this sort of debate always pops up because people always love to thrive on buzzwords just to get more likes, retweets, and to act all good and wholesome because mean game is mean. With that said, I'd like to take some time and get an outside perspective on this. I like to get fellow opinions on this matter and see how some people can react to these sorts of topics that usually seem to pop up every year or so. Here comes a new challenger! Persona 4 was my first Persona game, and while I go as far as saying I enjoyed the likes of Persona 3 and 5 more, the story and characters of Persona 4 left a major impact on me when I first played it back in 2020. There were aspects of myself that I could see in all of the characters, like Kanji's fear of being rejected by society due to his interests not being considered stereotypically male, like sewing and the like. The feeling of wanting to be understood and accepted, I can go on. Persona 4's cast of characters were like reflections of my past struggles, and it's why the game will forever be important to me even if it isn't my favourite in the series. So naturally, seeing discourse about the game pop up every month or so from people experiencing it for the first time is going to get annoying. Especially for the people that have been fans of Persona 4 since its release in 2008 and have had to deal with this for 14 years. Even more so when those new players take aspects of the game's admittedly shaky at times writing and twist it in the worst possible way. There are a few points people bring up in regards to Kanji and Naoto's sexualities in particular that aren't all based in bad faith though, such as the game constantly treating Kanji's sexuality as a punchline, mostly from Yosuke being so deep in the closet that Atlas cut out his romance option before before he could talk to Aslan. Why are you gay? Or, or Naoto's dungeon containing a lot of imagery that potentially plays into the negative and closed-minded views people have of being transgender, such as the sci-fi surgical equipment and swords which basically speak for themselves. Those are points against Persona 4 that I can agree with to an extent. However, considering Persona 4 is actually somewhat progressive for its time period, especially for a game released in Japan in 2008, these feel like bad moments, at least, and mishandled visual metaphors at worst. Remember, there was an entire social link for Yosuke where you could romance him that got cut out. If something like that got so far into development, then I don't think the parts of the game that slip up in regards to representation can be completely chalked up to Atlas being homophobic or having bad intentions. This is a game from 2008 that proudly stands against notions of toxic masculinity and workplace misogyny, and was originally envisioned with a gay romance social link that got cut out last minute. Despite Persona 4's numerous other flaws, those facts alone make me refuse to view the game in such a negative light. As for Kanji and Naoto themselves, I'm sure Carmen said it already, but in my opinion, if you view a character in a certain way, that makes you happy, then that shouldn't be taken away from you. In fact, if Kanji really was gay and Naoto was trans, there are opportunities there for some really powerful stories that I wouldn't mind being told. But it's when those personal interpretations of the characters get blended in with actual critique where things get messy. They aren't facts. Especially when they contradict the themes of the game. Persona 4 is all about characters who are wrongfully judged by people in society, developing their insecurities which manifest in the form of their shadows. Claiming that Kanji is gay because of his liking of traditionally feminine activities is not only hurtful in and of itself, it's the exact mindset that caused Kanji to develop his shadow in the first place, and why he began hiding his hobbies and interests by pretending to be tough. As Amino Sigiri puts it, Humans fail to see things as they truly are. They choose to see only what they wish. I acted only in support of this. By conflating facts of your personal interpretations, you're only reinforcing what the game was trying to tell you and why the Midnight Channel came to be. Headcanons about Kanji and Naoto for those that see them as comfort characters are an entirely different story which I welcome people to participate in if they wish. But they aren't canon, nor do they fit the themes of the game. I'd love for a future Persona game to feature queer representation in some form or fashion. And with Hashino not leading the way in Persona 6, because let's be honest, there are scenes in every Hashino Persona game with jokes at the expense of a queer character and then Royal severe really toned down 5's major issue under a different director, I think it may be possible to tell a compelling story about one or have a same-sex romance option. I mean, if Persona 2, a game released in 1999, can have more positive representation than any of the modern games, a game that released far before Hashino took the helm, I must add, then what's stopping a modern Persona game in the 2020s from weeding out the shaky aspects of the previous game's handling of the topic and writing something better? But as it stands, Persona 4 is a game that is going to continue catching controversy for years to come as more people become fans of the series, and it is 
is always going to annoy the fuck out of me when the arguments aren't in good faith like the ones I've already talked about. You know, honestly, you're probably wondering what the hell I'm even doing making this video. <laughs> Persona 4 is about 14 years old, it's an older game, and it's one that a lot of people like. And frankly, while I don't think it and Golden are perfect games, what pushed me to make this video? Well, it's because it feels like every year we get the Kanji is gay, Naoto is trans, Persona 4 is insert phobic here conversation. Don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to say that Persona 4 and Golden are above criticism, that's the last thing that I'm getting at here. If you personally believe that Kanji is gay or Naoto is trans, I have no problem with that. As I myself stated earlier, there are a lot of things that people could infer from their stories, but at the end of the day, they're just headcanons. And again, there's nothing wrong with that. The problem is when people start to flaunt those headcanons as fact, and when the game goes against those headcanons, they'll label it as homophobic or transphobic. That's where I have an issue. Toss in the sheer egotism that a lot of these people have, that they don't even want to entertain the possibility that they could be wrong, and you're obviously going to attract the worst kind of people. Funnily enough, I understand why people view Kanji as gay or Naoto as trans. It's because for a lot of people, representation means acceptance, and that acceptance is something that everyone has in their life. Trust me, I get it. But the problem arises when the demand for these interpretations to become fact and actively slam the game and developers when they don't get that. And I know this comes off as me shilling for the company and the machine, at least to those who ignore the rest of this video where I provided context for my arguments and my channel where I have actively criticized things I like. But I'm only talking about what actually happens in the games, and Atlas and other game companies aren't above criticism, but that criticism needs to be made in good faith. It can't be dishonest, and most of all, it can't be above criticism itself. But hey, that's just what I'm saying. I'm a comment and uh thanks for watching have a good day